Good morning uh, to those of you that are joining us uh, through, through the computer, through the internet, through YouTube, and also those that are listening by way of audio. Uh, grateful to have you join our uh, congregation this morning. I want to take you to the book of Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be in the scripture today. I concluded last week a series of sermons on knowing Jesus, and those are all available online. If you if you missed one or more and want to view them, please please do. Uh, in our morning uh, Bible study a couple of weeks ago, we finished up the second letter to Timothy, and one of the words that the Apostle Paul had to Timothy was a very kind of passionate plea from the heart, which was, Timothy, do your best to come quickly to me. Then a little bit later, he says something like this, and please try to come before winter. And it reminded me of a book, uh, picking up on that latter verse by Charles Swindoll called Come Before Winter. I happened to have it in my library and I pulled it out and I looked at it again and the book is set up with uh, really three uh, sections to it. The first being preparing for winter. Now I know we don't want to think about preparing for winter, do we? <laughs> um, but we know that in life sometimes, especially in climates where the seasons change and winter means cold, uh, we know that there's preparation work that has to be done. And it kind of made me think, well, maybe I could do a few sermons that had to do with how do we prepare well? Not for a winter coming, but that winter part of life, that maybe that towards that ending part of life. You don't have to be old to begin to prepare well for, for that which will come. Uh, one day to all of us, we can begin to prepare now. So um, it's a little bit with this mindset of how can we prepare to live well that I've, I've come to Ephesians chapter, chapter 5 and to verse 15 through 20. The Apostle Paul writes, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God our Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord add to, his, to this reading uh, His blessing. I wonder if you pray as I pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the intention that's in my heart be pleasing to You for I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. An elderly carpenter was ready to retire. He told his employer that he would miss the paycheck, but he wanted to live a more leisurely life. The contractor was sorry to see his good worker go and asked him if he could build just one more house as a personal favor before he retired. The carpenter said, yes, yeah, I guess I can do that. But in time, it was easy to see that his heart wasn't in his work. I think I got a picture here. Heart wasn't in his work. He, resort, he resorted to shoddy workmanship to get it done quickly. It was an unfortunate way to end a distinguished and dedicated career. When the carpenter finished his work, the employer came to inspect the house. And as the contractor finished his tour, he stopped and handed the carpenter the keys to the house and said, This is your house. It's my gift to you. 
Carpenter was a bit taken back. What a shame. If he had only known he was building his own house, he would have done so differently. Not too hard to think about how life is like the building of a house and how it may be that at some point we might get to the conclusion of the building and uh, be called to account for the house that we built and wish we would have thought through it a little bit better, lived it a little bit better, a little bit maybe uh, more pleasing and honoring to our Lord. Well, we come to uh, this place in Paul's writing to the Ephesians. It has some simple words for us, words that... Uh, come across so plainly, they hardly need explanation, but sometimes when we have those short and kind of plain words, uh, we feel inclined just to kind of zip over them, you know, we just read them and uh, let, them, let them shoot right in one ear and out the other, as my mom used to say. And yet they're worth a little more thought. I was thinking about life and I believe that there is a universal desire in the human heart, in almost every human heart, a, a, a universal desire to live a life that counts. To live a life that counts for something. We might pursue it in different ways. We might think that the answer will be found in a certain path that's quite different from what God would say. But nonetheless, however we might pursue it, I believe that we're all seeking to live a life that will matter, that will count. We want to live a life that is a well-lived life, that ends well, that has something to show for it. And I believe the Apostle Paul can help us uh, with this very basic of desire with practical words. Here's some of the principles that I pull from the opening portion of this passage. Here's the first one. A well-lived life is a carefully lived life. A well-lived life is a carefully lived life. And I look to uh, verse 15, the first portion of it. Be very careful then how you live. Be very careful then how you live. The Apostle Paul, in those first three chapters of Ephesians, has made a very careful kind of case for what we are and have become in Christ. When you and I enter into faith in Jesus Christ, uh, God has uh, blessed us in many ways, and He said certain things are true of us. Whether we believe it or not, uh, it is so. In fact, uh, this, this verse that I read uh, for you in, in uh, chapter 5, be very careful then. The word then kind of signals us to something that went before. Because of what I've already said, be careful how you live. And the then is all these things that we have become in Christ, all the things that God has made possible in Christ. If you go back to chapter 1, you can see that Paul is kind of just kind of overwhelmed with all that God has done for us. And he rattles off one thing right after another in that whole first chapter. I, I went back to um, um, the first part of it. This is a wrong reference, actually. It's chapter 1 rather than 5. But it starts out, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're a blessed people. I love what it also says just a little bit farther on. In Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Because of all that God has done for us, 
that we're in, uh, especially inclined to think about how can we live in light of this? How can we live into what God has made possible? How can we live in light of what God has done for us in Christ? How can we honor the God who has so loved us to make these realities possible? So when we think about a well-lived life, we don't just think about how can we live it for our own sake of well-being, but how can we live it now for the glory of God? A well-lived life is a carefully lived life, and I say as a believer, a well-lived life is a carefully lived life that honors God and especially our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, requires a carefulness. I began with an illustration about a carpenter, and maybe you're familiar with this carpentry um, mantra, motto, measure twice and cut once. There have been times when I have measured once, cut once, and then re-measured and said, what did I do? I measured wrong the first time, it's too short. We used to have an expression in, in, uh, in the small construction business I worked in. Uh-oh, get the board stretcher. <laughs> of course, there isn't one. <laughs> but we didn't always measure twice, cut once. But this is, this is uh, just a, a way to say, be careful. Think through it. Not just in carpentry, but in life. Careful thought before action. Careful living can be done in all areas of life. Certainly in the area of moral choices. But I want to suggest to you also, so very important in the area of time. The usage of time. The usage of time. Some of you are familiar with the name Charles Schwab might know it from investments but uh, there was a point in time when Charles Schwab was the president of Bethlehem Steel he consulted a man by the name of Ivy Lee with an unusual challenge he said to Mr. Lee Show me a way to get more things done with my time. And I will pay you anything within reason. It's quite an offer, right? A bit later, Lee handed the executive a sheet of paper with this plan. Write down the, the most important task you have to do tomorrow. Number them in the order of importance. When you arrive in the morning, begin at once on number one and stay on it until it's completed. Recheck your priorities and then begin with number two and then number three. Make this a habit every working day. Pass it on to those under you. Try it as long as you like. Then send me your check for what you think it's worth. That one idea turned Bethlehem Steel Corporation in, into the biggest independent steel producer in the world within five years. Take, write down the most important task and then do number one <laughs> until it's finished. Some of you might be curious, what's the rest of the story? What kind of check did the guy get? Well, sometime later, Mr. Swab paid to Mr. Lee, sent him a check for $25,000. And I give it to you for free. <laughs> no, it's his idea, not mine. But, but the point is this. Do the most important things first. Do the most important things first. 
It works in the steel business and it works in the life business. Do the most important things. Give your best energy to the most important things. One time a man was uh, meeting with an uh, executive. The man happened to be the president of an investment banking company. As he was uh, in conversation with his guest, the executive proudly displayed three leather-bound notebooks filled with goals for various parts of his company. They were impressive. After he had spoken so, so much about these goals that he had for his company, the, the guest asked him if he had set any goals in his spiritual life. Or had he set any goals for his family or his marriage? And the executive replied, you know, I never thought of that. And I think so goes life sometimes. We, uh, we're caught up with uh, spending time wisely in some areas, but maybe not in those that are of greatest importance. A well-lived life is one that is carefully lived, where we give thought to how are we spending our time? How are we using it for the glory of God in a God-honoring way? There's a second principle that I'd like to share from this passage. A well-lived life is a wisely lived life. And again, I go back to, to verse 15 and I add a little bit on to it. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Paul especially clarifies the thought of careful living in terms of being wise and not being unwise. But later he says, don't be foolish. And we know that uh, wisdom and being foolish all are, are kind of in that same camp, uh, opposites, obviously. Careful living is wise living. And we might say, uh, well, what's wise living? And of course, the Bible is filled with uh, an invitation to know what wise living is. And I pulled a few things, most of which come from the Old Testament. You know this passage from Proverbs chapter 9, where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In other words, a, a right respect and awe, even, even some, uh, some bit of trembling before, before God. I want to do what's honoring to you, God. I want to live well for you. I don't want to come to the end of my life and have to say, well, where's the fruit of it? Spent your life doing this and that, but when did you spend it for me? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we remember how Jesus uh, preached a, a great sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. And at the end of it, he talked about a wise and foolish builder. How the wise builder builds his house on stone so that it stands up into all the turmoil of life. But he, com but he said something which we sometimes miss, that the, the, the wise man is the one who hears the words of mine and puts them into practice. Wisdom is always about not just knowing the right that we should do, but doing it. Putting the words of God into practice in everyday ways. Go back to Proverbs and uh, think about this, uh, this word, uh, look at the ant. To consider its ways and be wise. Have you watched an ant lately? Or a group of ants? In fact, I believe this reference is especially to the person who might be inclined to be lazy. You sluggard, it says, watch the ant. <laughs> you get about the work. There's some interesting pictures of ants. I wasn't sure if it was a, um, it was a drawn picture or an actual one. <laughs> I love this one that has a, has a log, not, not a log, it's a twig, 
but that has a uh, has a twig, and one ant is, is is on top of it, giving directions to four or five underneath it that are carrying it. <laughs> I don't think that's the way it usually works with ants. They all get in on it, right? Look at the ant and get some wisdom about living, being about the proper work in the right season. There's one other word, and this one comes from the Psalms, from Psalm 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days aright, that I might gain a heart of wisdom. Help me, help me live the days well. Help me make the most of the days so that I can have a life that counts. You know, you can't have a life that counts unless the parts count. Much in the Bible about wisdom, some of it in, in these kinds of simple uh, proverbs and words, others come in the life of people. Certainly have many examples in the Bible of those who, who made foolish choices, who didn't live wisely. One of those that came to my mind Right off the bat was Esau. Jacob and Esau, two brothers, right? Esau kind of ends up <laughs> sort of uh, at the end of life in some ways grieving or close to the end. But earlier on, he made impulsive choices. You know, he saw a woman among the heathen people and he said, I got to have her for my wife. Took her as a wife to himself, even though uh, you know God's people were not supposed to marry outside of the faith. Later on, he comes comes back from uh, hunting and starving to death. Got to have some food and got to have it this moment. And his brother says, "Well, you can have some of this uh, soup I'm cooking here. Uh, how about I just trade you it for uh, your birthright?" Esau says, what good's a birthright if a guy's starving to death? Sure. Later on, his heart was grieved because he didn't get the blessing of the being the firstborn. Made impulsive choices, wrong choices. I think of Judas Iscariot. What greater privilege could there be of being one of Jesus' disciples to be with Jesus? Day in and day out. To see the man. As well as to see what he can do. But there's a practice that begins to be a part of things for Judas. You may or may not know this. Scripture tells us that Judas was the keeper of the purse. For the disciples of Jesus. And then it says this about him. And he often helped himself to the purse. So he starts making choices to skim off a little bit for himself. And it leads to a later choice to betray his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Choices have consequences. I want to say that every poor choice eliminates a wise choice that might have been made. Every poor choice eliminates a wise choice that could have been in its place. Uh, even some of those greatly used of God made poor choices. I think especially of David. We know his choices are ever mentioned or thought of in relationship to his life, that of adultery and murder. But even after forgiveness came in those places and God restored him and was using him greatly, David, at towards the end of his life, decided to count the men to see the size of his army. It was an act of pride. It was an act of self-sufficiency. His commander-in-chief said, David, please don't. Don't count the men. It dishonors God. But he went ahead and did it anyway. And later on would say, I played the fool. I did wrong. Choices. Choices. I'm not saying that a person can't be forgiven of wrongs done or foolish choices made. 
If that were so, we all would be desperately lost from God. Still, how much better to make the God-honoring choice of wisdom and to check the foolishness of the heart. I'm reminded that there are three areas, three tendencies, that so diminish our lives for God. John, the disciple, spoke of them in his uh, first little letter. He says three, three things that seem to always snag people. Three foolish things. The cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, or pride. The cravings of a sinful man, woman, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, pride. We, we look at our lives and we say, Lord, help me, help me. I don't want to live as a fool. I want to make wise choices. I want to make God-honoring choices. Certainly, Lord, I see you when I made those poor choices, but I want, I want to make good ones so I don't have to seek the forgiveness. Then there's a third thing. A well-lived life is a life that makes the most of opportunities. And again, I look at verse 15 and then go into 16 just a bit. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Making the most of every opportunity. A well-lived life is one that makes the most of opportunities. There was a, a Greek statue called Opportunity. I'll show you a picture of it. Some of the key features of this, uh, of this statue are that it, he has the winged feet, which are, are there to say that opportunities come and go quickly. <laughs> You never know how long an opportunity is going to be with you. You better grab a hold of it. Okay? Uh, a second thing about this, and you may or may not be able to see it clearly from this picture. I'm going to show you another one here in just a moment. But uh, the Statue of Opportunity has a long lock of hair in the front. A long lock of hair in the front. Which uh, the, the sculptor intended to, to say to you, when opportunity comes comes near to you, grab a hold of him <laughs> by the hair in the front. Right when he's there with you, grab a hold of it. All right? I'll show you another picture. The, on the back of this statue, though, the back of his head was completely bald. Uh, you can see it a little bit better on the TV if you're close enough, but maybe you can tell that the back is bald. And the idea behind this is that once opportunity passes by you, you try to grab for his hair, but there isn't any. You can't get a hold of him once he's by you. All right? Interesting. An interesting statue. An interesting statue called the Statue of Opportunity. Opportunity is fleeting. You must grab it as it comes. And when it passes, you won't be able to grab a hold of it again. What are the opportunities that are before us? What's the opportunities that are before us? It's interesting that a number of years ago, someone comment, commented that there would be no need for the patent, the patent office any longer. That everything that could be discovered certainly had been discovered by that point 25 years ago. And yet those of us that can think about what has come about in the last 25 years in the way of new invention, who would have thought that you and I could carry around a device where we would be talking on the phone at any point that we would like? And, and many carry around a phone that given the right ability, you can capture somebody's picture their actual live picture at the same time and talk to them as if you were almost face to face even though they're in another part of the world. And with that same device, if you happen to own one and know how to work it, you can look up virtually any kind of information that you're in need of. 
All this come about just, just of fairly recent days. We could talk about GPS uh, so that we don't even have to ask somebody directions any longer. We can get, uh, get to one place uh, to another. Many, many opportunities have come to us in these last days, and there are many opportunities that I think God will give to us in these days. God honoring opportunities. You know, there's, there's more ways that you can access solid biblical teaching and preaching than ever before. you got to be discerning. But you can, you can access so many good things, especially if you have use of the internet. Um, amazing things. In fact, mission work is going forward today in an unprecedented way because the Word is getting to places where uh, people have never been able to get before. But again, because of technology and, and uh, other things, we're able to get the Word to unreached peoples. It's interesting. I was around a few pastors here this last week, and one of them said, you know, uh, COVID has done a lot of things to disrupt us. But uh, in, in our congregation, there are a number of wives that would always come to, to church without their husbands. Husbands would not come. But there's a husband in one of the families who now is watching the sermons online with his wife. In fact, he will sometimes say to her, isn't it time for us to watch that sermon? <laughs> Another pastor said, uh, you know, we've gone online and now we have 15 viewers. And I found out that 10 of them are, are viewing from Tanzania. <laughs> well, it might not have been that country, but it was something like that. And he said, man, I didn't know I was going to have global outreach. Well, there's opportunities opportunities. The Apostle Paul says uh, we should make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I think it, it may have had in mind we got to be about this work today because there's so much of a need for good because evil is so present. There's such a need for godly people to live the face so that those that are evil can see at least an indication of good, though they may never own a Bible or a darkened church. It may be that Paul also has in mind, we, we've got to be about this work now to, to possibly stem the, the evil, to hold it back, to hold it at bay. I think maybe the Lord's return is in part delayed because of the work of the church, imperfect as it is, still going forward. It may be that Paul is saying there may come a time when evil will be so prevalent that we won't be able to do as we are today. Do it now while you have the opportunity. So there's a lot of ways in which that might be interpreted. But we have opportunities and we must seize them You've probably heard it said that the only thing necessary for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. Well, while there's opportunity, I must do the God-honoring thing. Must be looking for opportunities. Must be listening carefully to people when they talk to us. Are they, are they indicating by their conversation that they're looking for something better? that their life has so many things of despair or concern, wouldn't that be just the right opportunity to, to point them toward Christ? A friend of mine uh, and his wife uh, had spent uh, an evening in Amish country for an occasion. and So the next day they were on their way home and, and uh, his wife said she wanted to stop at this gift shop. He said, oh, do we have to? 
She said, no, she really wanted to stop. So they pulled in there. You want to come in with me? She asked. He said, no way. <laughs> I'll wait here. So he was sitting in the car. Another car pulls up next to him. And uh, the, the, the driver of the car apparently had on a t-shirt that caught this, this man, whose wife was inside, caught his attention. And he commented to the man wearing the t-shirt about it. And thus led to more conversation. And, uh, you know, this buddy of mine is telling this. And he's telling me all the details of this conversation. I'm thinking, oh, how did you get to all those places? <laughs> you know, like the guy just got married and they were going to be going on a honeymoon and uh, whatever. I don't know. All kinds of stuff. But eventually, my friend said to this gentleman, do you go to church anywhere? And the guy said, no. He said, they wouldn't want me in the church if they knew me. My friend said, all the conversation had been pretty lighthearted up to that point, but he said, then I got serious. Gentleman, my friend, is older. He said, I said to him, now you listen to me. We're all sinners. We all need the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And you can know Christ and His forgiveness. And he ended up leading the man to Christ in the parking lot. It was an opportunity. He didn't even think he wanted that opportunity. He didn't even want to stop at that gift shop. But God gave him the opportunity. And my friend said, you know, I'm retired. And I said to the guy, I said, I'm retired. I'm available. I don't care where you live. If you need me, I'll come. And he has since contacted me on several occasions by phone to help him keep the course, Right? We don't know, not just want to birth Christians, we want to see them grow up. My friend saw the opportunity that God gave to him that the Spirit was making possible, and he walked through it. What opportunities might, might we have with uh, maybe our own children or someone else's? Neighbors, or co-workers, or maybe even a stranger. Opportunities come, but we must be alert and ready for them. To do so may lead to a sense of being used of God for the glory of God. And I, I, I can't think of a, a more well-lived life than one that has impacted others for the glory of God. So this day I'm thinking with you about a well-lived life well-lived life, looking a bit on toward the end to shape the present. How can I live? I've got to live carefully. Got to, got to think about the way I'm living, the way I'm using my time. What's of greatest importance? Well-lived life is a wise living life. Think about my choices. Think about what honors God in those choices. And I think about a, a life that makes the most of every opportunity. I likely will not do so perfectly. Yet with the help of the Holy Spirit, the encouragement of the family of faith, and a more focused mind, God can and help, can and will use my life. So we, we want to live that life well for the glory and praise of God. Amen. Let me just uh, give a little closing prayer, if I might, a little kind of benediction of sorts to you, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring the service to an end this morning. Dear Lord, I thank you for these words tucked in the Scripture. Don't take up much space. 
Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Lord, help us with this day and the days ahead that you give us to want above all other things to honor you. Strengthen us with your Holy Spirit. Guide us to those opportunities. Help us to see them when they unfold. Use us, even in our weakness, to do the work of God. Your work. Bless these people. Both those present in body and those that are watching and listening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Look forward to seeing you again.